our paper. Sorry. So this is the last paper in the this paper this session current session. So we do have Lucas Lucas right and from University of Toulouse. He is third year PhD student uh, and finishing up. I guess he came from industry and yeah. doing PhD. Yeah. And his general interests are on vehicle networks and his title, his paper's title is Field Trial for Enhanced V2X Multi-Rat and Dover in Autonomous Vehicle Networks. Let's listen. Thank you, dear chairman. I hope you're hearing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, fellow attendees, ladies and gentlemen of the committee. Thank you very much for having me today. I think that's quite a, something like a first to me. So uh, I'm really grateful that this paper has been selected. And thus today, we're going to summarize the key ideas, experiments, plural experiments, and findings behind this paper. And first off, hope it doesn't work. Uh, yeah, that was to be expected. Thank you. All right, yeah, no problems. So first off, a little bit of context. So this work has been a part of the Autocampus project in Toulouse, which aims at exploring and evaluating innovative connectivity solutions for the future integration of connected autonomous vehicles in challenging contexts, such as urban contexts, and more specifically, university campuses. This subject is important to us in France and probably also in the US because the Americans love the university campuses. And I think these shuttles at the moment are autonomous and the issue that we find with them is that when they are roaming around their own track that has been predefined, the amount of applications that are offered in these shuttles is quite limited because the data that is generated from their onboard sensors need to be computed with their own onboard unit, their computing unit. And that renders it kind of uh, not precise enough in the way they are computed. Uh, in order to respect some of the constraints, the performance constraints of the future use cases and applications for these kinds of autonomous vehicles, as they are quite dangerous, they can be quite dangerous, they can move quite uh, with some amount of speed, the tasks that need to be computed uh, need to be done so in very short constraints of latency and performance. And to us, the solution is uh, lies within V2X communications, so vehicle to everything communications. And that way, vehicles can offload tasks and data to edge servers whose job it is to compute these kinds of stuff in slow, in low amounts of time. And uh, also kind of relying on sensor data from other vehicles and other elements on the road. And that way we could further the applications that could be offered by connected vehicles in the future. These communications, they can happen through various kinds of radio access technologies. I'm not going to detail them precisely because it's in the paper, but I'm just going to separate them in two categories. The first one is the classic uh, uplink and downlink fashion, such as LTE and 5G, where communications need to go through a relay and access points and then spend some time in the core of the network in order to reach the destination. And the second category would be the device-to-device -device direct communications that are generally catered to vehicle, vehicular communications. And usually we have two kinds of them, DSRC, which stems from Wi-Fi and cellular V2X, such as LTE V2X and 5G V2X, which, uh, which uh, stem from cellular uh, technologies, but by avoiding this access point situation. And lately, CV2X has been predominant for the past few years, given that DSRC has been around for a longer amount of time, a little more than 10 years. So the main motivation for us is for this task offloading, in, in order to enable this task offloading, we would like to improve the reliability of the communications in order to allow these vehicles to offload critical tasks in very short amounts of time while addressing the issues that we can find in these challenging situations, such as a vehicle evolving in an urban scenario, in an urban context with people, with other bigger vehicles, with buildings that could generate shadowing and path loss. And this to us has been kind of a relative void in the literature because the experimental trials of each works that we've lately have been focusing on favorable contexts such as highways and speedways and generally not that populated scenarios with not that many obstacles. And we think that for the advanced use cases that we need to study, we should first address the many challenges of connectivity in urban scenarios. So first off, 
we needed to make sure that our playground was indeed benefiting from LTE and all 5G coverage. At the moment, we didn't have the authorizations to use the autonomous shuttle that I've shown you in the introduction. So we took my good old Nissan Micra from 2002, and we used uh, V2X hardware that we had in order to provide it with some amount of connectivity, LTE and 5G. And then we did our best to replicate the behavior of that vehicle if that was the shuttle. So respecting the track and also the limitations of the shuttle if that was the shuttle. And while roaming around the track, we would periodically the physical layer metrics for LTE and 5G in order to generate a heat map. And through that heat map, we would need to, that would help us to determine if there were any blind spots for LTE and or 5G. And there are, sadly. So at the top is the SNR heat map for LTE, and at the bottom is the same for 5G. What we see, first of all, is that there are some amounts of blind spots for LTE over there, mostly, and some of it over there, which is not an issue because these do not concern 5G. So it's not that big of an issue because if LTE is highly disturbed uh, on the physical layer, then you could just switch to 5G in order to maintain connectivity. That's fine. But for 5G, uh, we see over there three blue spots, which mean that these spots have minus infinite SNR, which means that 5G cannot be used over there. But these spots are also part of the LTE blind spots, which means we have an issue there where, connect where cellular connectivity is not available. Now that we know it, though, it's not that much of an issue per se, because for the following architecture, we can provide access points and device-to-device -device solutions to counter these blind spots. So basically, the angle that we've selected for the, for the following experiments is that while these coverage areas are differing depending on the technology that you use, and while there might be very critical tasks needing to be offloaded as quickly as possible, because that's the issue with vehicle, with vehicular applications, some tasks can be highly critical. In order to make sure that these tasks can be offloaded very quickly, almost immediately, we should mitigate the reliance of task offloading on cellular connectivity. And that's why we needed to make sure that the following architecture would provide this service continuity for these generated task offloading requests. And our solution is called Series V2X. And that's basically our grid-based vertical handover scheme. So how does it work? We know that we have, in vehicular architectures, we usually have two kinds of devices, the OBUs that I mentioned earlier, onboard units, and the roadside units, which are basically structurally the same, but they are positioned on the side of the road to act as edge servers, to provide for some edge computing, and also with some potential to communicate with other elements on the road. So these RSUs are somewhat aware of their coverage area, depending on the technologies that they harbor. And they are going to subdivide this coverage area into a grid. And that grid is going to be filled with time with the RSU receiving regular messages uh, broadcast by vehicles. And these messages are called CAM messages. So if you work in the, in, in the vehicle field, you know what they are. Basically, they are contextual awareness messages. They are broadcast periodically by the vehicles in order to let the people around them know what's going on on their side. So usually they contain information, contextual information, such as speed. Also, the most important part for us is position. When the RSUs receive these messages from the OBUs, first off, they are going to monitor and log performance metrics from these packets as they arrive. And these can be whichever ones you want. So that gives some amount of um, customization to this solution. And then these performance metrics can be correlated with the position data that is within the packet. And this data, yeah, and, and this data then as well be correlated with one cell of this grid for for the RSU. By repeating the operation through multiple RSUs and also for multiple packets, incoming packets, we can fill that, this grid and also update it with time with new performance metrics in the case that an obstacle enters the field and then starts disturbing the performance. So these grids are somewhat responsive as well. And then with this new awareness that has been found, we can, uh, the RSUs can format grids in a, short, in, a, in a short message and propagate this message to the vehicles. So now we've delegated the power of vertical handover to the vehicles themselves in, themselves instead of leaving it to, a, to an external scheduler, for example. So we've distributed the power of the selection of a, of a radio access technology. So that's basically how it looks. So this grid could be for one new access technology. So multiply this grid for the other technologies. 
what we see is that, for example, for this vehicle following its own track, let's say that this is the grid for a technology called A. Let's call this technology A, whatever. It knows that when entering the coverage area of the RSU that is located at the, at the street light over there, uh, this is the RSU because usually we position them over there. It's going to know that the first few cells, the first few positions are going to be highly favorable to task of loading transmission over technology A. But then the vehicle knows that behind this tree that acts as an obstacle, technology A is going to be highly disturbed on the physical layer, which makes it less valuable as a technology to offload critical tasks. So then the vehicle itself is going to search through the other kinds of knowledge that it has on other technologies and trigger a handover if necessary, and also if beneficial. And that is going to happen before the vehicle itself starts to try and offload data or request task offloading, and then noticing that these requests have failed because they haven't reached the destination and then triggering offloading, the, um, triggering a vertical handover. That would not happen because the grid gives some amount of proactivity to the handover. So that's how it works. Let's see how, let's see how the results are going to reflect if it works or not. So first off, the architecture. So as I've mentioned before, we benefit from commercial LTE and 5G coverage. This didn't change. Now we do have the shuttle to use, yes. And then we also have state-of-the-art V2X, which uh, provides connectivity through DSRC and cellular V2X compliant with release 15. These are the side direct um, device certification ones, and also LTE and 5G, obviously. Structurally, as I said, the OBUs and the RSUs are the same, but the two RSUs are going to be positioned on the side of the road, and the two OBUs are going to both be positioned within the shuttle. Why did we do that? It's because one of them is going to harbor service V2X, and the other one is going to offload tasks through other schemes, such as re like reference schemes, and by positioning these two in the same vehicle, we can then know that if there are some things happening that would hinder propagation, it would be reflected on both OBUs and thus giving us some more uh, valuable input. So that how, that's how it looks. And the shuttle is, is again over there with the OBUs inside of it. The playground hasn't changed compared to what I've shown you on the introduction. I've just shown now the position of the two RSUs. One is over there, one is over there. Basically, they are supposed to uh, they are supposed to be positioned along these long streets in order to benefit from longer line of sight situations and thus um, improving performance. But the RSUs, you can position them wherever you want. That's the magic of it. I've shown you how it looks. It's not that hard to just move it around and stuff. All right, so as for the reference scheme, so now it's to actually know what it is. The first reference scheme is the cellular scheme. So basically it's our upper bound. We make the OBU request task of loading through cellular technologies such as LT and 5G, whichever one is perceived to be the best at a given moment. And the opportunistic one is a little more complex. As I've said, as I've said, CV2X has benefited from high amounts of interest for the past few years. So I wanted to verify that if CV2X was the only device to device technology to be used, uh, if the performance was similar or better than the one that we use with uh, Series V2X, which also leverages DSRC, which is the older one that at the moment isn't really, uh, isn't really interesting to most people. And the opportunistic one basically as, acts as the cellular one, except that it can also shift between LTE, 5G, and CV2X if coverage is detected. If, if device to device CV2X coverage is detected, then handover can be triggered towards CV2X and these task offloading requests can be sent over there because they are assumed to be beneficial to latency compared to LTE and 5G due to the access point situation that I've talked about in the introduction. Now let's talk about the results. All right, so range-wise, what we see first is that for CV2X, we see that the, the coverage ranges are much longer than DSRC, around 60%. Uh, what we did was take the data from the grids and projected them on a top-down view of the playground. So that's what you see. You see on the left is the first grid, is the RSU grid, and on the right is the second RSU grid. That's what we did. Uh, what we also see is that DSRC is more stable in the first jet from the access points, which doesn't really happen for DSRC, because what you see with DSRC is that you, the performance, the latency performance gradually decreases the further you get from the access point. That doesn't happen for DSRC. However, what happens with the SRC is that it is less robust against obstacles, especially with this little spot over there. You see that there is a high increase in latency, which didn't happen over there. And that's likely because there was an obstacle between the OBU and the RSU, and that provoked 
uh, that hindered performance and in a much higher degree for the SRC than it did for CV2X. And this behavior is confirmed with the handover location over there. Uh, at the top is the handover location for the opportunistic scenario, and at the bottom is the same for series V2X. Uh, PC5 is the name of the interface for CV2X. So what we see is that, especially uh, if you remember the playground, this little corner is littered with trees and obstacles and many things that would generate handover. And what we see with series V2X is that for these little spots over there, we see that we're switching back and forth between DSRC and CV2X, which means that when line of sight occurs between the OBU and the RSU, we use DSRC. And when there are obstacles due to this sensitivity of DSRC uh, towards obstacles, the switch happens to use CV2X instead. And then it goes back and forth with each tree that the shuttle goes behind. All right, and finally, regarding latency distribution, um, what we did was empirically separate in categories following the recommendations of 5GAA, and these recommendations are correlated with use cases. So the most critical use cases for vehicles need communication latencies of under 10 milliseconds, and then less critical ones between 10 and 20, and so on and so forth. That's what we did. First thing that we see is that, as we expected, the moment you rely on cellular technologies to offload tasks, you are pretty much guaranteed to not respect any constraints for somewhat critical uh, vehicular applications. It is a guarantee that the latencies are going to exceed 50 milliseconds, which is not, which is not viable for us. What, what we also see between the opportunistic and the greed scenarios is that the reliance on DSRC allows the grid scenario to shave off extra milliseconds. And that way it reduces the proportion of 10 to 20 milliseconds and 20 to 50 milliseconds packets because uh, when both of the coverages for CV2X and DSRC are available, the fact that the vehicle is able to switch to DSRC to gain a little more uh, milliseconds helps us greatly for this, rel for this uh, reliable coverage and, uh, and this improved performance. So what did, we learn? what did we learn today? So first off, we learned that multi-rats as, as, as a paradigm is essential to the functioning of these future uh, vehicle applica vehicular applications. So basically, heterogeneous coverage is necessary for us to improve this, re this reliability on, uh, on connectivity. However, multi rat is not enough on its own. We also need to add this amount of performance awareness that is dear to Series V2X, because that gives us some amount of robustness and also some proactivity that allows us to, how do, could I say that? I mean, we might be able to just move forward with and trigger and trigger proactively vehic uh, vertical handovers before we, before we have to just send task offloading requests and then notice that there were there were multiple failures and then as a response to that trigger a vertical handover this proactivity allows us to gain some amount of time and in the future our perspective for the future would be to analyze the scalability of this because and two OBUs and two RSUs are probably not enough. We have received additional hardware and positioning more RSUs track in order to cover the whole of the track would, would uh, allow us to limit this reliance on cellular coverage as we have determined that it is not beneficial to us at all. So that's what we're working on right now. So stay tuned for the other versions of this paper and uh, the new discoveries that we are going to make with more RSUs and more OBUs. I think that's my time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Questions? So we, sorry, we're stealing from your lunch time. We're going to go there, but we need to have some questions. So thank you very much. This was really interesting. Thank you. So I had a question about, uh, you know, the trajectory and planning. Yes. And you said this is going to help you try to figure out, especially in the grid deployment, how you can do these ha vertical handoffs. Yes. Um, at the end, you mentioned some sort of like a, you know, prediction scheme where you can predetermine if, you know, the chances of errors and so on. Did you look into, you know, prediction models for these handovers? All right. Oh, that's, that's a really good question. Like that, that could be another perspective for us. But like at the moment, what we did was in this project, there are many particles of it that are intertwined in some way and that impact our research. So for the track in and of itself, the way it was defined, uh, basically, we arrived with the project and we said, okay, this is going to be the track, deal with it. And knowing that, we decided, all right, well, first off, we're just going to do 
well, an ana a preliminary al analysis for the coverage. And then we tried with these findings, we tried to address them directly. So that that's the angle that we chose first. And with the results that we found over there, we thought, all right, now we can try to scale it and we can try to update it with the, with the new releases. So that's the angle that we chose. But the angle of predictability could have been used with new model, and that would have impacted the models and the algorithms and everything that we did over there, but did not take that into account. It's basically a question of angle that we chose. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, one more question. Thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation and the well, nice work. I had another question about scalability, but not in terms of uh, enhancing the connectivity in the grid, but scalability in terms of coverage, the surface, because right now you are in a campus scenario. How does this scale in a real world, you know, in a big city or whatever? All right. Uh, so this is a question that we've asked ourselves before, before starting to experiment on it. So what we did was, First off, we assumed that we wouldn't, we probably wouldn't be able to cover a whole city, especially if these are big cities like in the US, you, these cities are huge. So we assumed that these would not be able to be, to be covered all the way through due to the amount of blocks and roads and twists and turns that we, that we should be able to cover. So we assumed that these solutions, they are generic. You can, you can tailor them to your needs of performance metrics. But regarding scalability, the more roads you add, the more equipment you are going to need. That's not an issue per se. It's just a question of finance. And uh, to us, the question of geographical scalability, if I may call it that way, is not as critical to this solution than the, than the question of actual equipment scalability. With more devices participating in the life of the network, that I think is going to impact the solution more than just while broadening the scale of it. So to us, this is the, the question of scalability on a geographical standpoint is to us, it is not worrying that it is not as, as worrying for us. It's more a question of budget. And that's what we've seen with the current deployments that we have in France. We have two or three experimental deployments of uh, smart cities. And usually they are made in small city blocks and they are constrained in these small areas mostly because of finances. All right, any more questions? All right, then let's thank our speaker for the question.